Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and today I would like to talk about the inverting mixing configuration. We could also call this the summing configuration to help distinguish it from the use of the word mixing in radio frequency and communication applications where we have a signal that's being multiplied by some sort of sinusoid. That version of mixing, the multiplicative version, is not what we're talking about here. We're talking about additive mixing. So the way this is typically framed is that we have a feedback resistor, and I'll call this RF. And then we have a whole bunch of inputs, each of which has its own resistor. So I might have V1, I might have V2, I might have V3, and so on and so on and so on. Now, I'm just plotting these as nodes sitting here out in space. Of course, we have a convention where essentially we're assuming that these are ideal voltage sources that create whatever currents are necessary in order to balance the various equations that govern circuit behavior. But we're going to go with the convention that we just know those voltage sources are there, just as we know that the output is being measured with respect to some ground. Now, the usual brute force approach to this circuit will be to draw some current arrows. Let's suppose I were to draw all of the arrows going in. You could draw these however you want, as long as you're consistent when writing down the equations. So let's look at the currents going into this node. So I've got VO minus nothing, because quite importantly, this node here is being held at a virtual ground. Assuming that our op amps are ideal and following the various golden op amp rules associated with the presence of negative feedback, the output here of the op amp will produce whatever voltage and current is necessary in order to maintain that virtual ground to keep the terminals at the same voltage. Of course, this can be violated in a dozen different ways. And if you take my analog circuits for music synthesis class, we actually look at a circuit by Don Buchla that deliberately violates these rules by voltage starving the power supply of the op amp. So here, I'm not going to bother writing that minus zero. Let's see, so the current is going to be over RF, and then the other currents flowing into that node will be V1 over, oh, I should name the resistors. Let's call this R1, we'll call this R2, we'll call this R3. V1 over R1 plus V2 over R2 plus V3 over R3. We'll write this all equal to zero. And what we'll do is we'll move everything over to the other side. So I have minus V1 over R1, minus V2 over R2, minus V3 over R3. And you can easily see how this would extend if I wanted to have other inputs. And actually, let me pull out the negative sign and also multiply both sides by RF so that the RF appears up here. Let me move the VO down here a bit. So here we have our standard inverting mixing configuration, and this is beautiful for a lot of different reasons. One is that if I want to change the scaling factors on the different voltages, I can just change one of the resistances. So if I want to change the coefficient on V1, all I have to do is change R1, and then what's happening to V2 and V3 their scaling factors will stay the same. If I want to change everything globally, I can multiply all of these resistances by the same constant, or I could just change RF. So I have a lot of flexibility here. This contrasts with the kind of passive summing networks we looked at in the last lecture, in which I can't change the scaling factors on one of the signals by just changing one of the resistors. I would have to make some other changes to keep the scaling factors on the other signals the same. Another effect we saw in the context of a passive summing network is that if you were to take some of the inputs and just leave them disconnected versus grounding them, essentially putting in silence as a signal, you wind up changing what all the scaling factors are because you're essentially taking certain resistors in or out of the circuit. Here it doesn't matter. I can actually connect V1 and V2 and leave three disconnected and that essentially would be the same as grounding V3. 
Rather, this term is zero because we're actually putting in a zero voltage for V3, or rather this term is zero because we just leave it disconnected altogether. It doesn't matter. It doesn't affect these other terms. And what you have over here on this side doesn't even necessarily need to be a voltage through a resistance. If you think about it for a second, what is this actually doing? This resistor is taking this voltage and turning it into a current, and then the feedback resistor is turning that current back into a voltage in this inverting configuration, which is why you get that minus sign. So another way to think about this structure here is that it's something that's turning a current into a voltage, and it doesn't really care how that current is being generated. If you think back to the lecture where we talked about different ways of representing signals in analog circuits, either as a voltage or a current, the circuit here is taking the form of a transimpedance. It turns a current into a voltage, and the fact that we have this virtual ground being set at the negative terminal makes it an ideal current input. So I could easily imagine that there's just some other current source here, let's call it I4, that's creating a current that's getting jammed into here, and I could just add it in here. So I do have the minus because of this inverting configuration. I'll just have RF times that current. In that sense, it might be more natural to think about the terms in this expression, like this V1 over R1, as a conductance, G1 times V1. So multiplying by the conductance turns a voltage into a current, and then multiplying by this feedback resistance turns the current back into a voltage. So you can really think about this circuit as performing the operation of addition using Kirchhoff's current law. Now, I don't actually have to pull out Kirchhoff's current law to come up with this formula. If we remember from our previous lecture about the three op-amp configurations all electrical and computer engineers should know by heart, we talked about the basic inverting configuration. I think I called this something like R1, and then we had an RF, and then we had our output here. I'm going to put a prime on the output so I don't get it mixed up with the output of this big mixer part that we have here, but I'll go ahead and call this V1. Now, in that lecture, we discovered that VO prime would be equal to the feedback resistance, which always goes on top, over R1. And remember, the way to remember that there's a minus sign here is that if I'm holding this at a virtual ground and the current flowing in here has to equal the current flowing out, that means that these voltages must have opposite signs. So if I look at this and then I use the idea of superposition, I can directly derive this formula because I can imagine temporarily grounding V2, setting those to zero, and that will give me the first term. To get the V2 term, I can ground V1 and ground V3, which will set those inputs to zero. And remember, if I do that, basically there's no current running through these resistors because I have the same voltage on each side given that this summing node here is being held at that virtual ground, and that gives me my V2 formula. And then to deal with the V3 term, I can ground V2 and V1 and modify the formula appropriately by changing the one subscript to a three, and I get the same formula. So I don't actually have to write down a Kirchhoff's current law equation if I've already analyzed this circuit for just one of the inputs. So what if I want to put in a current source over here? Well, superposition still works as a concept. I could just ground V3, ground V2, ground V1. All of these are deactivated, and I can see what happens with I4. Well, that's just going to be RF and multiply it by I4 to turn it from a current into a voltage, and I have to remember the minus sign there because it's an inverting configuration. So let's talk about input and output impedances. If this is an ideal op-amp, then the op-amp should be creating whatever voltage is necessary. It's acting as an ideal voltage source, so we would think of the output impedance as being zero.
Now, what about the input impedance? It depends on what we're talking about. If we're talking about the input impedance seen by something feeding this node here, we call this a low impedance summing node, ideally zero, from the standpoint of current sources that are trying to feed it. This resistor RF is thirsty for current. It's happy to take all of the currents coming in. So seen from here, we would think of it as having a low impedance. Now, what about the voltage inputs? Well, from the point of view of something feeding V1 versus something feeding V2, all either of these sees is its particular resistance going to this virtual ground. So V1 is just going to see a resistance R1. All it knows is that it's a voltage. It sees a virtual ground over here. Only as far as V1 is concerned, it doesn't care if this is a real ground or a virtual ground. It just sees ground. The resistance it sees is just R1. So let's denote that as something like I in, and then I'm going to put a one up here as a superscript to indicate that it's associated with this V1 input. Similarly, V2 is just going to see a resistance R2. That's the input resistance it sees, and so on for V3, V4, or however many more you want to add in here. This is beautiful because as long as this op amp is doing its job of holding that negative input terminal at a virtual ground, it's decoupled the inputs. So if I change R1, I'm changing the input impedance that whatever is feeding this V1 input sees, and I'm changing the coefficient for V1, but I'm not doing anything to what's happening with V2. V2 still sees an R2 input impedance, and V2 still has the same coefficient multiplying it. This is very different with a passive network, where when I changed one of those resistors, I wasn't just changing all of the coefficients on all of the signals being summed, I was also changing the input impedances. And very importantly, this kind of invariance doesn't change whether I'm grounding one of the inputs or whether I'm disconnecting it altogether. So this makes it really nice for audio mixers. I can take a patch cable and plug it into a jack and mix the signal from my synthesizer or drum machine or whatever, or I can just leave that disconnected entirely and I'm not changing what's happening in the other channels I'm trying to mix. So this is a really beautiful configuration using Kirchhoff's current law to do the addition for us somewhat incidentally using these resistors to turn voltages into currents in a controlled, predictable way, and then using this feedback resistance to turn that sum current back into a voltage.